Thank you. It's a great honor to be with patriots and conservatives. God bless you. A little bit of history. In 1977, Ronald Reagan delivered a speech at CPAC that is one of the great speeches about conservatism ever delivered. Among other things, he said, I've always been puzzled by the inability of some political and media types to understand exactly what is meant by adherence to political principle. All too often in the press and television evening news, it's treated as a call for ideological purity. Whatever ideology may mean, and it seems to mean a variety of things, depending upon who's using it, it always conjures up in my mind a picture of a rigid, irrational, clinging to abstract theory in the face of reality. We have to recognize that in this country, ideology is a scare word, and for good reason. Marxist-Leninism is, to give but one example, an ideology. All the facts of the real world are in the bed <clears throat> of Marx and Lenin. If the facts don't happen to fit the ideology, the facts are chopped off and discarded, Reagan said. The principles of conservatism are sound because they're based on what men and women have discovered through experience in not just one generation or a dozen, but an all combined experience of mankind. When we conservatives say that we know something about political affairs, and that we know can be stated as principles, we are saying that the principles we hold dear are those that have been found through experience <clears throat> to be ultimately beneficial for individuals, for families, for communities, and nations, found through the often bitter testing of pain or sacrifice or sorrow. That was Ronald Reagan. They tell us to forget about Reagan. So who are we supposed to remember if we forget about Reagan, the most successful president in modern history and the most conservative president of modern history? <clears throat> now, Reagan spent decades helping build the conservative movement. He spent decades challenging the Republican establishment. He crisscrossed this nation, spreading the word about liberty, national security, capitalism, faith, and the Constitution. Reagan actively supported Barry Goldwater in 1964. He won the governorship of California in 1966 and 70 by huge margins, and he governed as a conservative. At the 1968 Republican Convention, his name was offered as an alternative to progressive Republican candidates. In 1976, he famously challenged a sitting Republican President Gerald Ford and the entire Republican establishment in Washington stood against him, and he barely lost. Ford received 1,187 delegates to Reagan's 1,070, a mere 117 delegates. And I love Mississippi, but if the chairman of the Mississippi Republican Party hadn't stabbed Ronald Reagan in the back, he may well have been the nominee in 1976. So it took Reagan three times until he finally broke through the Republican establishment's firewall. But well, once he did, once he could present his case to the American people, he won two massive historic electoral landslides, both in popular and electoral college votes. He won in red states. He won in blue states. He won in purple states, although we didn't color code them back then. In 1980, in a three-way race, Reagan won 44 states, 489 electoral college votes, 52% of the popular vote. Jimmy Carter won six states, 49 electoral college votes, and 41% of the popular vote. But he wasn't done. In 1984, Reagan won 49 states every state except Minnesota. 
He won 49 states, except Minnesota, and he lost Minnesota by less than 4,000 votes against Mondale. That was his home state. Reagan received 59% of the popular vote, 525 electoral college votes. Mondale won Minnesota and the District of Columbia, 13 electoral college votes, 41% of the popular vote, and that was it. The most conservative president, perhaps in history, and certainly in a century, was an enormously successful candidate and president. And we're told conservatives can't win. Reagan was a full-throated, principled conservative. He was a full-throated, anti-establishment conservative. And the Washington establishment, Republican and Democrat, fought him every step of the way, including during his two terms as president. How do I know? Because I was there. That's how I know. Reagan was not a cult-like figure. Reagan was not a cult-like figure in which anyone could project their beliefs upon him. He was a man of strong ideas. He was agenda-driven. There was no confusion about where he stood on matters of faith, national security, domestic affairs, and other areas of life. There was no confusion about whom he blamed for most of the problems in society. Big, centralized government. He used to refer to it as the Iron Triangle, the Iron Triangle of Congress, the media, and special interests. And it was Reagan who first termed, uh, coined the phrase, we will make America great again. And again, I should know, because I wore the button that said exactly that. Reagan was not a recent convert to conservatism. He was a long-time advocate for it. And during his two terms, Reagan unleashed the American people from the iron grip of government, resulting in spectacular economic and job growth. He slashed taxes. He slashed regulations. He slashed discretionary spending and he turned big chunks of the federal government back to the states and localities. He moved immediately and urgently to rebuild the United States military. He was hell-bent on destroying the Soviet Union, and he did. And today, millions of people in Eastern Europe and elsewhere live in freedom who earlier lived in tyranny behind the Iron Curtain. Reagan pushed communism out of Central America despite the best efforts of congressional Democrats to defend these third world dictators. Reagan insisted on funding the Strategic Defense Initiative, even though he was mocked for it. They called it Star Wars. Today, Star Wars is a crucial defense to our country and the nation of Israel. Reagan also populated the federal courts with originalists, men and women who would actually interpret and uphold the Constitution of the United States, men like the late, great Antonin Scalia. And even at the Federal Communications Commission, Reagan appointed commissioners who deregulated the broadcast rules killed the so-called Fairness Doctrine and made possible nationally syndicated conservative talk radio. <laughs> Reagan was all about the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, and especially free speech, especially the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth, the Ninth, and the Tenth. So you can see, Reagan was no late convert to conservatism. Reagan was the leading figure in building the conservative movement over a period of decades. Reagan was not elected because he was a great deal maker. He was elected because he had solid principles.
Reagan was elected because he had solid principles born of liberty and our founding, and there was no confusion about where he stood. It is from that basis that Reagan worked with Congress. It is from that basis that Reagan would negotiate deals, or he'd go over Congress's head and directly to the American people. That was the Reagan Revolution. After Reagan left the presidency, having laid the foundation upon which future Republican presidents could build and expand from his success, the Republican establishment resorted to its old ways. They called the return to big centralized government kinder and gentler. Later, they called it compassionate conservatism. Today, they call it common sense conservatism. While conservatism is already kinder and gentler, it's already compassionate, and it's already common sense, all wrapped in one. There is nothing to apologize for. And these phrases are nothing more than apologies and excuses and tolerance for the growing soft tyranny of centralized government and the acquiescence to it. Nor is conservatism about nationalism or populism, phrases that have no concrete meaning or constitutional basis and are more relevant to the French Revolution than the American Revolution. Conservatism is Americanism. It's about patriotism. It's about those human and institutional characteristics that undergird them. Comes 2010, the end of the Bush administration, the beginning of the Obama administration. 2010, having endured 22 years of Republican and Democrat rule post Reagan, another political revolution was born the Tea Party Movement. The Tea Party Movement rose from the neighborhoods and communities. It rose spontaneously from the American citizenry. And it changed the political landscape, not only in Washington, but in states throughout this country. In 2010, the congressional election cycle, the Tea Party Movement turned out in mass. 63 House seats went from Democrat to Republican gave the Republicans the majority in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, the Republicans picked up six additional seats. And the pathetic irony, the ungrateful Republican establishment blamed the Tea Party for some of the other losses in the other states that they were responsible for. And the Tea Party wasn't done. In 2014, the Tea Party rose up again. Republicans won another 16 House seats, increasing its majority to the highest number since 1928. In the Senate, the Republicans picked up nine more seats, winning back the Senate from the Democrats for the first time since January 2007, when Karl Rove lost the Senate. But the Tea Party revolution was even more ubiquitous than this and the electoral success even more profound. As a result of the Tea Party movement, Republicans today control, outright control, all branches of state government, 24 states. Democrats control outright seven, the lowest since the Civil War. Republicans control 66 of 99 state legislatures. The ratio of Republicans to Democrats in state senates and state houses since 2009 has increased in virtually every state Senate and virtually every state House. Democrats have lost over 900 state legislative seats since the rise of the Tea Party. Republicans control over 4,100 seats, the highest number since 1920. And today, Republicans hold 31 governorships, Democrats 18. Don't tell me the conservative movement can't win elections and doesn't have power. This is the power of the conservative movement. This is the power of ideas. This is the power of the citizenry. In the states, 
we've seen grain activity and momentum in many areas and ways towards our principles. From right to work, tax cuts, limits on abortion, to efforts to enforcing voting and immigration rights and laws. But at the federal level, the Republican Party, now in complete control of both houses of Congress, refused to truly engage Barack Obama, the most reckless, lawless, imperial president in modern, if not all, American history. From spending, from spending and Obamacare to the EPA and immigration to separation of powers and scores of other matters, despite having made campaign promises, they've done damn little about it. So, given the disastrous Obama record, minuscule economic growth, massive governmental growth, millions falling out of the workforce, an actual reduction in median income for millions of families, an explosion of welfare benefits, unprecedented waves of legal and illegal aliens, the evisceration of our military, the abuse and nationalization of our police departments, the crushing regulations, destroying American businesses, packing the federal courts with radical activists, the usurpation of our Constitution, including separation of powers in the Bill of Rights, his dripping contempt for our ally Israel, his love affair with the Castros, his tolerance of Islamic genocidal murders, and his hate America first foreign policy, etc., etc. We conservatives, we conservatives are in the best position in three decades to win back the presidency in a landslide. That is only if we do something we have not done since 1984, 32 long years ago, nominate a true, known, solid, unapologetic conservative for the presidency of the United States. How many of you are 45 years or younger? If you're 45 years or younger, you've never had a chance to vote for a conservative in a presidential election. We've not had a conservative administration since the early 1989 January. The same Republican establishment that failed to deliver legislative victories after we handed them electoral victories and lost the last two presidential elections with their nominees, resist and obstruct the nomination of a real conservative. But let me be clear, it's not enough to win the nomination by personally beating down your opponents with such vulgar and ruthlessness, espousing conflicting or ever-changing beliefs, trashing the establishment one day, yet bragging about working with them the next, that is, playing both insider and outsider, and then expect these disparate parts of the Republican Party and the conservative movement, having been exploited and turned against each other, to suddenly rally to your cause. Obviously, it is a daunting task to defeat the Republican establishment in a race like this. But it's still not enough. It is the essential first step that must be taken to reach our ultimate goal the nomination of a principled conservative who we can rely on to try and help restore our Republican Constitution and who will base every decision that comes to his desk in the Oval Office, every negotiation with Congress and foreign governments, every appointment to every position in the federal government and the federal courts on securing our liberty and unalienable rights. If we want to make America great again, as Reagan first said, you must get behind the most conservative candidate in this race. And I will close with this. What do you say, Nixon? I didn't know the bar was open this morning.
Let me close with a Reagan quote, because people, for some reason, don't want to talk about Reagan, the most successful president in a century. And let me, let me also say this, and I said this at another event a couple of weeks ago. We conservatives have controlled the presidency 15 years or so out of the last century. Coolidge and Reagan, and that's it. What do you say we try again? Yes. <laughs> Reagan said, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step in a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us, we justified our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. Fellow conservatives, let us justify our brief moment here and do all that can be done. And God bless you all, and God bless America. Thank you very much.